Questions. I recognize the member for Temiskaming Cochrane. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Franco Ontarians from across our province, in fact, Francophones across this country, have made it clear to the Premier that he has disrespected the Francophone community. He has made a major mistake. Will he do the right thing, restore funding to the French language university, and restore the independent French language services commissioner? Premier. Well, through you, Mr. Speaker, Franco-Ontarians have played a major role in Ontario. Even though it's 3% of the population in Ontario that played a major role of culture and history in different areas of business in, in Ontario. And we did, we did listen, because I've talked to hundreds of Franco-Ontarians, as they have my cell phone number like everyone else does, I had an opportunity to speak to them. They really appreciate us being up forward about the university, a false promise made days before the election from the Liberal government to actually use Franco-Ontarians. Premier to withdraw. Withdraw. Not too, not too sure what I was withdrawn. Um, and, and it, through, through, you, Mr. Through, through you, Mr. Speaker, they realize that our province was left in a bankruptcy state. $14.5 billion a deficit we're facing. We're paying interest of over $12 billion a year. They realize they were being used as pawns, and that's shameful to use Franco-Ontarians as pawns during the election. Here, here. We Pause. did listen, and what we did, we're empowering the role of the French Language Service Commissioner under the Ombudsman. We have a fantastic new minister. Start the clock. Supplementary. Once again, to the Premier, even though they are a founding people of this country. This is more than just a broken promise. The Premier's dashed the hopes of franco ontarian youth by scrapping the plans for a university and told them that their rights won't be respected by scrapping the watchdog who protected French services. Half measures and damage control won't solve this crisis. Will he do the right thing? Restore funding to the French language university and restore the independent French language services commissioner. Premier. Through, through you, Mr. Speaker, the opposition is misleading the people. There was no funding. There was no funding. Ask the Premier to withdraw the empire. Withdraw. To conclude his response. It was, not the, it was not in the fiscal budget, but what we did do, Mr. Speaker, we are empowering the role of the French Language Service Commissioner under the Ombudsman. We have a fantastic new Minister of Francophone Affairs, a wonderful person, Caroline Maloney. Couldn't ask for a better representative. And I'm hiring a senior policy advisor responsible for Francophone affairs in my office. But through you, Mr. Order. Speaker, through you, Mr. Speaker, we have 11 colleges and universities offering 300 courses in French language, and we want those 300 courses to be filled. Unfortunately, they aren't filled. <clears throat> Thank you. Final supplementary. Once again, to the Premier. Franco Ontarians have always fought to ensure that they have their place in this province and to defend their rights. Now they have one clear request to cancel those cuts. Will the Premier do what is necessary and to reverse the project to cancel the French University? 
and the Commissioner of French Language Services. Premier Minister. Through to the Premier. Mr. Speaker, you cancel you can't cancel something that was never there in the first place. If we go back to the eleven universities and colleges offering the courses. Opposition government. I encourage our young people in high school to fill the courses, fill the three hundred courses that we have and, and make sure they're filled. So it's our job to get our communities into these French language courses, 300 of them yeah. in 11 different colleges and universities across the province, as my opposition uh, opposition leader, for a temporary for leader, <laughs> opposition temporary for leader Sudbury, knows very well that we support the Franco community yeah. in Ontario. I've Fun. spoken to hundreds of them. Matter of fact, Speaker, I've spoken to more. Franco Ontarians than anyone in this chamber the last few weeks. And Order. Start the clock. Next question. The member for Brampton Centre. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question. Uh, thank you. It is uh, for the Premier. Um, the people of Oshawa were dealt a hard blow this week, but they're already organizing to save jobs and reverse GM's decision to abandon them. Yesterday, the Premier accused them of spreading false hope. Why is the Premier so certain that they're wrong to fight for their jobs? Premier. To you, Mr. Speaker, and to the, the member of Brampton Centre, all I've heard are these leaders get up there, talk, 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 giving these poor people i feel so sorry for them because again my phone my phone has been ringing off the hook i have talked to hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of gm workers my first phone call started at 6:15 this morning and i once i talk to the people at gm they understand they don't appreciate jerry diaz giving them false hope when they have to go home and tell their spouse and tell their kids yeah. there might be a chance when Jerry knows exactly there's a chance. Our job is to find new jobs, to create an economy and an environment out the, in the Durham region to attract new jobs, new opportunities. And they appreciated my call. And the members themselves don't agree. Stop, stop. Order. Start the clock. Supplementary. Speaker, across North America, elected leaders from all political stripes say they're ready to stand with GM workers and fight GM's decision to walk away from their communities. Why is the Premier so convinced that all of these leaders are so wrong to keep fighting for good-paying jobs here in this province, and that giving up is the best option here for workers in our province? Premier? What would you do? For you, Mr. Speaker. For you, Mr. Speaker, and to the member of Brampton Centre, it's called grandstanding. They know the truth. The Prime Minister knows the truth because the President of GM spoke to me four times. Jerry Diaz knows the truth because he's speaking to the uh, President of GM numerous times. I spoke to the CEO of Ford Motor Company, Honda, Toyota. Everyone knows. GM is leaving. Our job is rather than talking and giving people false hope, which is the worst thing you could do to a family, is create opportunities, new jobs, create the environment by lowering gas prices, lowering higher rates, making sure that we create a friendly atmosphere for businesses. Because through you, Mr. Speaker, this decision wasn't done in the last six months. No. It was in the works for the last year and a half. That's the truth of the matter. Order. Start the clock. Final supplementary. 
Thank you, Speaker. Well, families in Oshawa deserve leadership right now, and they need a government that understands that Oshawa has the skills and talent to succeed, that's right. and a government that's willing to fight GM to ensure that those jobs don't go to China or Mexico, but stay right here in our province of Ontario. Instead, they have a premier York who's Center telling Condor. Oshawa families that there's no point in even trying, no point in even trying to fight for their jobs. North Why is this North premier so determined to just Condor. give up? Premier. Again, through you, Mr. Speaker, this is a terrible, terrible situation for the people of Durham. But there's only one scenario that it would be even worse. What would even be worse if the NDP got elected? There'd be 7,500 people at the Pickering Nuclear Station that would be out of work as well, and their families. That would have been even more of a disaster. You, talk, you listen to the Prime Minister saying, his staff saying, all options are on the table. Well, Prime Minister, you can't be promoting carbon tax on Monday and then wonder why jobs are leaving on Tuesday. Because jobs are leaving because of the terrible carbon tax, because of cap and trade, because of the highest hydro rates in North America, the highest taxes, the worst labour laws right here in Ontario. But guess what, Mr. Speaker? We're changing it. We're making, we're turning the corner and making an atmosphere and an environment. Next question, the member for Oshawa. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, I have said I will fight alongside workers in my community, and so I will bring their questions directly to the Premier. Michelle, a worker at GM, writes, quote, Jennifer, thank you for standing up with us in this fight. I am a second-generation auto worker. I was born and raised in Oshawa. General Motors raised me. It paid for all my birthdays, extracurricular activities, medicine when I was sick, and dental, food, school, and the roof over my head. My father and I have given our blood, sweat, and tears to this company and have always supported them by purchasing the vehicles that employed us. I am absolutely devastated, knowing that I am soon to be out of a job with hardly any notice. I worry how I'm ever going to get through Christmas, let alone how I'm going to pay my mortgage with no job. I hurt so badly inside thinking about what I will face in this next year. I hurt because we currently have a Premier who doesn't care about me or my family or General Motors having a manufacturing presence in Canada." End quote. Uh, Michelle's question, Speaker, they're heckling Question's. Michelle. Michelle's question to the Premier is, quote, why does my government not care about me and my family? End quote. Premier. Through you, Mr. Speaker. I guess what I said about the Prime Minister applies to the NDP. You can't support a job-killing carbon tax and wonder why companies are leaving by the droves. That's a big issue. Member for Ottawa Centre, come to order. My friend, my friend from the Durham region, I would like to know what the NDP is doing to create new jobs other than voting against a bill that gives money back to the most needy people in society, lowering hydro rates getting rid of the job-killing carbon tax, scrapping Bill 148, which was a job-killing bill. Yep. What is the NDP doing? I'll tell you what they're doing, Mr. Speaker. They're doing nothing, zero. As you're sitting there running around talking, we're out there creating new jobs. We're, we're going out there, as we did in Southwest Ontario, opening new plants across this province. We're going to continue to open new plants, attract new companies. Stop Order. And ask the Premier to withdraw. The House will come to order. Start the clock. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. And what I am doing is standing alongside my community because I believe Oshawa is worth fighting for. <laughs> Speaker, the Premier has spoken to GM. I have spoken to them too. It sounds like we are in for really uncertain times. However, I know better than to count Oshawa out. But on day one, 
the Premier said it was over. He threw in the towel without a fight. Speaker, my community does have some hope. The thousands of GM workers, their leadership, and the tens of thousands of workers in the automotive supply chain have some hope. One would think the Premier would want to meet with them to see where that hope comes from and make sure that he has indeed considered every option to keep those jobs. So my question is, why does this Premier have no hope at all? Premier. Through you, Mr. Speaker, I'm just wondering if anyone from the NDP even spoke to the president of GM. And the answer is no. The answer is no. Order. I wonder how many people the NDP talk to, frontline workers. I, I've talked to hundreds. I've talked to Order. hundreds. And it's amazing, Mr. Speaker, when I talk to him on the phone, again, starting at 6.15 this morning, my last call was at midnight last night, and I talked to him, and every single call when I speak to him, they say, you're right, Doug, and by the way, we're no fans of Jerry Diaz. I heard that over and over and over again. All he was doing, one person described him as a 1930 union member sitting in front of his members, banging on the table, but doing nothing. We're doing something. We're out there. We're creating jobs. And we will create jobs for each and every person that lost their job. And I can tell you, Durham will be booming under our Next question. Start the clock. The member for Northumberland, Peterborough South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Over the past few days, our government has laid out a plan to help workers affected by GM's recent announcement of their closure of their plant in Oshawa. We know these workers are going to need help transitioning to new careers over the next year. I know personally our Premier has responded on the ground, has responded to hundreds of calls and hundreds of more text messages. So my question is to the minister. Can the minister update this house on steps our government is taking to help workers in Oshawa? Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Training. Thanks, Speaker, and thanks to the member from Northumberland, Peterborough South, who is with the Premier and I and our Minister of Environment and the President of the Treasury Board and other caucus members from the Durham region in Oshawa, meeting with officials there, meeting with the CEO of the Chamber of Commerce, talking about the next steps for Oshawa after the closure of General Motors, which seems uh, imminent as far as uh, car and truck production is concerned in late 2019. Speaker, it feels like the Premier and I have been on the phone for the last week constantly talking with business and civic leaders in Oshawa, but also across the entire auto sector, working with them on how we can make it easier to build cars in Ontario, how we can make it easier to sell cars and drive cars in Ontario. Mr. Speaker, that's a real plan and how we're going to dig ourselves Fox. out of this. What the Minister of Training, Colleges and Universities is doing with the Rapid Reemployment Team, that's a real plan, yeah, yeah. Mr. Speaker. Yeah. Mugging for the cameras. That's that's not a plan. Stop the clock. Member for Waterloo, come to order. Order. Start the clock. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the minister for his work on behalf of a number of my constituents affected by this recent announcement. You know, constituents like Jim, who reached out to me, who's looking in a time of uncertainty for certainty. Certainty in, he's certain in his skills training, and he's looking for certainty from this government, and that's what we've given them. Certainty in skills training. Certainty in linking jobs into transitioning to a new career in the next year ahead. Not desk banging and not grandstanding. Can the minister, Mr. Speaker, we know that efforts on the grounds to help General Motors workers find new careers, but there's more our government is doing to improve the prospects for workers and businesses in Ontario's auto sector. Can the minister elaborate on the premier's commitments regarding our government's plan to help Ontario's auto sector? Minister. 
Well, Speaker, as a matter of fact, I can. We've already done a lot, including passing the Making Ontario Open for Business Act. And the Premier said it yesterday. You can't be out there in favour of a carbon tax on Monday and then complain about job losses on Tuesday. It just simply doesn't balance. It doesn't add up. Getting rid of the aggressive, job-killing carbon tax, the cap-and-trade system that we had in place here for the last couple of years in Ontario is going to help us build cars. It's going to help us buy cars, and it's going to help people drive cars yeah, in Ontario. Yeah, yeah. That's a real plan. But we're also committed to working with the federal government in a full court press to get rid of Section 232 tariffs. Those are on steel and aluminum. We want to get those tariffs lifted, Mr. Speaker. They're an attack on auto sector jobs and manufacturing jobs on both sides of the border, Mr. Speaker. I've spoken with the U.S. Ambassador. Response. I know the Premier has spoken with the U.S. Ambassador. We're going to do everything that we can to make sure that Ontario is the best place to do business in North America. Hey, hey. Restart the clock. Next question, the member for Essex. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, the Premier likes to make a big show about giving out his cell phone number, but this week it seems like he's not too happy about the nature and the volume of calls that he's getting from the Oshawa region and the workers at GM. Speaker, the president of Unifor Local 673 tweeted yesterday, quote, King Vaughan, come Doug forward. Ford called our national president, Jerry Diaz, to ask if he can stop Uniform members for North from calling him on his personal cell forward. phone regarding GM. <laughs> Speaker, does the Premier think that if he can stop the calls from coming in, the people in Oshawa won't care that he refuses to fight for their jobs? Premier? It, it, through you, Mr. Speaker, when I did speak to Jerry Diaz, I told him there was a lot of rude, Order. nasty swearing going on attacking my family, attacking my brother, and I said to him, I wish you would get your members, the rude ones, to stop calling, but the good ones that I've talked to, 99% of them, and there was 99% good calls, and when I spoke to him, I found out one thing, Jerry Diaz doesn't have too much support within his own Unifor uh, union. That's what I learned. I learned that people actually realize and appreciate the truth. They know the biggest problem here are the tariffs. The, their tariffs are killing the auto sector. And I made it very clear, if the Prime Response. Minister wants to do something, get rid of the carbon tax, get rid of these job-killing tariffs. That's the truth. I've talked to more GM workers. Thank you. Start the, start the clock. Supplementary. Speaker, uh, the Premier can blame the Prime Minister. He can blame Jerry Diaz. In a question yesterday to the Minister of uh, Economic Development, the Minister said that he had been on the phone. Your government's been on the phone with GM for weeks and weeks and months. But it's pretty clear that it was only until GM spoke with Ford that they decided to get the hell out of Dodge. Member for King Bond, Speaker, the Premier is in, in for quite the education this week. The women and men fighting for their jobs in board. Oshawa aren't the trained SEALs and backbenchers who do standing ovations on command, and they're not Dean, French, uh, Dean French's temp temper tantrums aren't going to scare them. Speaker, for the workers watching at home may they, who may not have the Premier's number but want the Premier to fight for jobs. Yeah, I'm going to caution the member on intemperate language and ask him to withdraw. Speaker, thank you. Speaker, for the workers watching at home who may not have the Premier's personal cell phone number but want the Premier to fight for their jobs, can the Premier confirm that his cell phone number is still 416-805-2156? Let me say that again. 416-805-2156. Is that what it is? Premier. Boy. You, you know something? <laughs> You're just proving he's available, unlike you. If you wouldn't give your you know, number out, through you, Mr. Speaker, Speaker, come your number out. Through, through you, Mr. Speaker. I want to hear your 
Through, through you, Mr. Speaker, I'm glad that people talk to me. You don't get stuck in a bubble like the opposition does. They, they get stuck in this ivory tower. They say they're for the working people. Through you, Mr. Speaker, they aren't for the working people. They're, they're, they're there for the Jerry Diaz's and the rest of the big heads of unions. They aren't there for the frontline union workers. It's amazing. And the best thing that happened. Unifor did send out my number, and the best thing you did is remind people to call me. Because once you speak to them, <laughs> once you actually speak to people and you actually talk to them and you get into a conversation, thank you, thank you. Stop the clock. Stop the clock. to ask the House to stop the constant interjections. I can't hear the member who has the floor when I'm constantly calling members to order. Start the clock. Next question, the member for Mississauga Mall. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for Attorney General. This government has done tremendous work to date supporting our law enforcement and providing them with the support they need to help our communities safe, whether it's aligning the standards for police carrying and administering naloxone with other responders or replacing the crumbling public safety radio network to ensure frontline responders have reliable, modern tools and resources. And yesterday, our government announced an additional funding to initiate to support our law enforcement in helping victims of crime and keeping our communities safe through the Civil Remedies Grant Program. Mr. Speaker, can the Attorney General provide us the details of these programs and benefits it will provide to the Ontario's law enforcement? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member from Mississauga Malton for the question. Our government takes the safety and well being of Ontarians very seriously, and we are always working to find ways to support initiatives that help us achieve those goals. Which is why yesterday our government announced that through the Civil Remedies Grant Program, we will be providing $1.5 million in funding to help 17 police services across the province keep our communities safe. This year's funding will help law enforcement agencies run 21 programs to assist victims and prevent unlawful activity. These include programs such as Project Enhance in Sudbury, which will receive $77,000 to prevent and combat sexual exploitation, human trafficking, organized crime, and opioid trafficking through state-of-the-art surveillance Response. equipment. Mr. Speaker, our government values and respects the work our law enforcement does, and we want to ensure that they have the resources they need to continue their work. These grants will— Thank you. Wow, 21 programs that will receive funding this year throughout the province and spoke about one of these projects. Mr. Speaker, this is certainly a good news for many communities across the province. Our law enforcement agencies do fantastic work in supporting victims of crime and working to prevent unlawful activities. And it is reassuring to know that they have the support and the resources to do that. You spoke about one of the projects in Sudbury receiving support from the government. Can the Attorney General share this House the additional projects our government is supporting to bolster Ontario's law enforcement? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Attorney General. Mr. Speaker, I'd be delighted to provide that information. Many of these projects are aimed at combating human trafficking here, here. and supporting survivors of this heinous crime. Project Safe Horizons open, Eyes Open in Barrie will receive $92,000 to fund outreach for information sharing across all Ontario police services and outreach, outreach to local businesses to increase awareness of human, tra human trafficking. The Seeds Project in Brantford will receive $93,000 to help create an international database of individuals, addresses and vehicles associated with human trafficking in the, in the community. 
The exit strategy in Windsor will receive $99,000 to provide officers with advanced technology and training to enhance their ability to identify both victims of hu human trafficking and perpetrators. The program will also provide support to community partners, allowing for a multidisciplinary Bonds. approach to rescuing victims. Mr. Speaker, I'd love to be able to list all the projects, but as time is short, a complete list can be found on the Ontario Newsroom website, and I encourage everyone to check out these important, important projects and speak to them. Thank you. Next question, the member for Hamilton Mountain. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Speaker, Anna is one of the speakers who joined us in the media studio this morning. She is a fearless youth advocate. She is also a former Crown Ward. She's a social worker, and she is joining us here today in the gallery. Anna knows what the system <laughs> Anna knows what the system is like, and she knows how important the Advocate's Office is for youth who are hurt, abused, or taken advantage of. To her, the big question is, where are young people supposed to go now? Like many, Anna knows this cruel decision to cut the Child Advocate's Office makes absolutely no sense. The government must restore the independent Child Advocate's Office that can make sure that voices of vulnerable youth in this Question. province are heard. Will the minister commit today to reversing this hurtful decision? Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Thank you very much, Speaker. I appreciate the question. Obviously, it's great to see Anna at the legislature. Just over a week ago, she was actually in my office as the minister responsible for children's issues, and I was listening to her and other uh, other children and adults with lived experience, and uh, that made my resolve even more stronger to make sure that we uphold a stronger and higher standard for child protection in the province of Ontario. That's why we are moving towards the ombudsman, who has a stronger oversight capability than the child advocate did. We are going to ensure that there's a, a turnkey uh, a unit for children, especially there. And finally, one of the things that I think is most important is, with respect to the Ombudsman and the coroner, they have investigative powers that are able to uh, provide my ministry and children's aid societies, as well as youth detention centres, with investigations as a result, uh, sorry, with recommendations as a result of their investigations. Response. And they're stronger than what the advocate had, and we're going to continue to do that. So that's why I've asked for all pending investigations by the child advocate to be reviewed by our ombudsman. Supplementary. Just in case, and I know the minister is new in her role, but the ombudsman is reactive and the coroner is when children are already dead. Speaker, for many in Ontario, it's unbelievable that the Ford government would cut the independent child advocate's voice to save a few bucks. Today, the gallery is filled. People are watching from home. These are people who have experienced care, their advocates and their parents, and they want to share their disappointment and disgust of this decision. This cruel decision means that children and youth will be left to fend for themselves, left without an independent, dedicated officer of this legislature to speak out solely for these children's needs. Speaker, why does this minister believe that children and youth do not deserve to have their voices heard by an independent officer of the Ontario Legislature? Minister. Minister. Thanks very much, Speaker. Obviously, the move that we're making strengthens oversight and accountability. It will strengthen the investigative side in the Ombudsman's office. And I think the member opposite knows Position I've been here for 13 years. I used to be a children youth critic, so I do know a thing or two about or what I'm Davenport, talking about. Come where the order. member opposite gets confused from time to time is she thinks the investigative unit is the for same Ottawa, as that. Center, That's why I created three tables, one in digital for Hamilton Mountain, one come for order. youth in care, and one for youth in custody. And they will York report Center, directly order. to me, who's accountable to the Premier and the people of this province, and to suggest, and to suggest that we are lessening an advocacy role Mountain, when we are actually going to have this embedded within my ministry is disgraceful, it's fear-mongering, and again, it is unbelievable. Stop the clock. Member for Hamilton Mountain, come to order. 
Once again, I'm going to inform the House uh, the Speaker's having a great deal of difficulty even listening to what the person has the floor has to say because of the cost and interjections. Therefore, I will call you to order once, and I will, I will, I will warn you, and if I have to speak to you again, you'll be named. <coughs> hope that's clear. Start the clock. Next question, the member for Scarborough Guildwood. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. First and foremost, my heart goes out to the Oshawa and the Durham community. I can imagine what those families are going through right now. Two of my brothers are auto workers, and they were not surprised by the news on Sunday night. It's not unusual for lines to have to fight for products in this sector. But this government's response Member has been so Center. underwhelming at best. It Member has for left Stormont everyone Dundas, feeling Gare. dejected. GM employees don't want retraining Member speakers. For they want their jobs. In 2013, Hyde Hines announced Listen. that they were closing Listen. Leamington operations. Listen. 740 jobs were at stake. It was a done deal. Question. But the government of the day did not sit back. Speaker, the collaboration Listen. between the previous government, Listen. municipalities, and business saved 250 From jobs. What is the is Premier warm. doing to save those GM jobs right now? Premier. Through you, Mr. Speaker, before I, I answer the question of the Scarborough Guildwood member, I had a great experience the other day. I went to the Painters Union, there was about 600 people, and guess who I saw? I saw the member of provincial parliament from Scarborough Guildwood, and I introduced her and told the crowd they did a great job. But I, I'll tell you one thing, it was a real wake-up call for the member over there, Mr. Speaker, because I've never had a warmer reception when I walked through those doors, everyone was standing on their feet, cheering away. They, they, I went all the way through the room. My point is, frontline union members support this government. They don't support the NDP. They don't support the Liberals because they know the Liberals and NDP destroyed this province. They made it uncompetitive. They had 300,000 manufacturing jobs leave this province under their watch. They bankrupt this province. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Premier, it's not about you. It's about those workers and it's about those families. That is your job to fight for, for those Bob. workers and their families. Speaker, Member for Stormont, so Dundas, South Glengarry is to warned. This government is what are your plans for a changing economy? You talk about the 300,000 manufacturing jobs for that Niagara West. Lost. You refuse to talk about the 800,000 jobs that were created. Our for Northumberland, like Beaver every South. other place in the world, is experiencing a changing workforce. Automation, innovation, technology. What are you doing? to lead this province into a new era of work because you have said the ship has sailed and that is not good enough. Exactly. It is not good enough for those workers. Question. It is not good enough for those families. They want leadership. What are you doing in the face of a changing economy oh, to make sure time. you stand up for Ontario jobs or are we just going to be importers of hundreds and thousands of vehicles? And Premier. Through you, Mr. Speaker, and to the member of Scarborough Guildwood, we'll tell you what we're doing. We're changing every law that they destroyed this province on. That's what we're doing. We're, we're changing the job-killing labour law 148, which we did. It's the best bill we put forward, Bill 47, creating jobs. We're lowering hider rates. Under their watch, we have the highest hydro rates in North America. The number one issue when I went across this province and talked to small, medium, and large businesses, they were killing it. The regulations under their government, there's 380,000 regulations that they created. There's, there's the carbon tax, cap and trade. 
destroying this entire country. Companies left by the droves, they left to a tune of 300,000 manufacturing jobs. Now the door is open for business. People know Ontario is open for business. We're attracting new jobs. I would remind the House that when the Speaker stands up, your microphone goes dead. We will have order in the remaining 24 minutes of this question period. Start the clock. The member for Kingston and the Islands. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and through you. I apologize. I, I, I made a mistake. I, I have to. I have to recognize the member from Mississauga Centre. President of the Treasury Board. My constituents in Mississauga Centre are concerned about how government spending ballooned over 15 years of Liberal mismanagement. While the NDP supported the spending, it's clear that there was little oversight and even Brand less Brand. governance practices when they mattered the most. In fact, one of the key points from the line-by-line -line review was that the Liberal spending was not based on evidence, was decentralized, and was out of control. It's clear, Mr. Speaker, that the fall economic statement tabled by the Minister of Finance earlier this month is going to improve our province's fiscal standing. Si on veut que notre province prospère, if we want a prosperous province, we have to change the way we spend and behave. Please tell us how announcements in the fall economic statement will help control Question. government spending. President of the Treasury Board. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Saga Centre for that great question. The line-by-line -line review showed that labour costs are our single largest expenditure across government, totaling about $71 billion. Shockingly, under the Liberals, government agencies were not required to have their bargaining mandates approved by government. Oh, boy. Well, Mr. Speaker, as part of our promise to restore accountability to government, that lack of oversight ends right here, here, right now. <laughs> Earlier this week, I informed my colleagues that agencies with collective agreements expiring at the end of the year must seek bargaining mandate approval through the Treasury Board. And let me be crystal clear, in no way does this impact collective bargaining rights. Instead, it ensures that the people footing the bill, the taxpayers of Ontario, will know what the final amount will be. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, thank you to the President of the Treasury Board for that excellent answer. The practices of the previous Liberal government are indeed shocking. It's encouraging to see that this government is taking bold action to increase accountability and oversight on spending. In fact, the line-by-line -line review showed that every 1 per cent increase in compensation-related spending translated into a staggering $720 million in additional costs. Mm. It's clear that after 15 years of Liberals signing blank checks on the backs of the people of Ontario, our government is taking action. Well, Mr. Speaker, accountability and good governance are not just sound bites. They are the very foundation what we are working for, a government that respects the taxpayer. Here, here. Can the President of the Treasury Question. Board please inform this House what the impact of this new accountability initiative will be? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Matt, thank you for the member. The uh, review revealed that uh, for 15 years the Liberals were signing the paychecks. They were letting someone else fill in the blanks. If we want this province to prosper, if we want our pu public servants to be sustainable, we must change the way that government behaves. Yeah. This new oversight effort will apply to 24 agencies, accounting for approximately $2.6 billion annually in compensation costs. Ontarians can be assured that we are taking action to control government spending and are implementing appropriate oversight measures. Mr. Speaker. Not only will this government approve the numbers going on those checks, but in the memo line, we will have one word and one word only, accountability. accountability. Yeah, yeah. Thank you.
restart the clock. Now the member for Kingston Islands. Again, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And through you, my question is for the Premier. Yesterday, the Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks was asked whether the government's new climate change plan would use tax dollars to pay polluters. And, Mr. Speaker, shocking, I know, but the minister did not answer. I'll ask again. Is the Premier flipping the principle of the polluter pay model upside down by forcing taxpayers to pay polluters instead? Premier. Through, through you, Mr. Speaker, our plan is a fabulous plan, and our Minister of Environment is going to be rolling that out today. But let me tell, let me tell the people here, the Paris Agreement 2030's goal is 30 per cent. Guess what, guess, what, guess what Ontario's at? Ontario's at 22 per cent already. We will hit, we will make sure we hit the 30 per cent by the end of 2030 because we have the best plan when we went across the province people want clean air they want clean clean lakes they want clean rivers they want clean parks and i can tell you the people that want to pollute the companies that want to pollute Sons. we're going to come down twice as hard on them okay. thank you supplementary Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I, I hope the Premier has time to read the Paris Climate Agreement at some point. Uh, yesterday, yesterday, the Minister was asked to explain where he will find the money to pay for his climate change plan, and again, he refused to answer. And then the PC caucus gave him a standing ovation for that. So I will ask again, how will the Premier pay for his climate change plan? Premier. Minister of Transportation. Minister of Transportation. He's a uh, man of many skills. Thank you, uh, uh, Member Opposite, for that question. And listen, our our uh, Environment Minister will be rolling out our plan uh, for Ontario today, and I'm pretty excited about how it's going to roll out because our plan is going to ensure that we are going to protect and conserve uh, land, air, and water. We're going to address urban litter and waste. We're going to build resilience to the impacts of climate change, such as extreme weather events, and do our part to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. But I can tell the member opposite what we're not going to do. We are not going to reintroduce a job-killing regressive carbon tax to this government that we've been cheering on for decades. We are not going to take the I apologize to the Minister of Transportation. I couldn't hear a word you were saying because of the standing ovation. Supplementary. Or was that the supplementary? That was the sup. Okay. Next question. Member for Niagara West. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Infrastructure, and it's a question I'm very eager to ask. Yesterday, I joined our Premier, the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care, and the Minister of Infrastructure for an exciting announcement in my riding of Niagara West that will cut hospital wait times and end hallway health care. I'm, yes, I'm proud to say that, unlike the previous Liberal government, our government for the people is prioritizing investments in essential health care infrastructure projects. And I'm so proud to have worked with the community and my, former predece my predecessor and former PC, Tim uh, Hudak, to look after the needs of families and seniors in my communities. Since I was elected two years ago, I've been fighting for a rebuild of the West Lincoln Memorial Hospital so that patients across the Niagara region will have the quality health care they deserve and expect. Can the minister please share the great news on how we are delivering infrastructure for the people of West Niagara? Minister of Infrastructure. Well, thank you very much, and thank you uh, to the member for Niagara West for that question. Uh, Mr. Speaker, our government is committed to making life easier for the people of Ontario, and our government is committed to ending hallway health care. Those two core principles come together in the Ministry of Infrastructure, touching countless lives. Yesterday, I was honoured to join our Premier, the Minister of Health, and the great member from Niagara West for a truly historic announcement. 
The West Lincoln Memorial Hospital, Mr. Speaker, is over 70 years old, yet on average each year more than 25,000 people visit the ER and approximately 1,000 babies are born in that hospital every year. Whoa. Starting in December of this year, our government is investing $8.5 million in upgrades to that hospital, which will serve that community in the time ahead. And Mr. Speaker, our government will continue Response. to invest in the right infrastructure at the right time and in the right place. The West Lincoln Memorial Hospital is most certainly a promise made, promise kept. Thank you. Stop the clock. Start the clock. Supplementary. Thank you, Minister. I'm so proud of yesterday's announcement, uh, and I know my community is very, very excited about this big news. I'm proud to be part of a government that stands for the people of this province, and I need to thank the Premier, I need to thank the Minister of Health and the Minister of Infrastructure for standing with the people of Niagara West yesterday. My company, my, my community, <laughs> has been long waiting for this time. We know that the Minister of Health prioritizes patient safety over all else and has been working tirelessly to end the days of hallway health care in our province. Can the Minister of Health please elaborate on the importance of yesterday's historic announcement with respect to fixing our health care system and ending hallway health care? Minister, Minister of Infrastructure. Thank you. And I want to thank the member for his Minister question Health and for being a tremendous advocate on behalf of his community. The people of Niagara West are in very good hands. Patients in Ontario want to know that the care they need will be there when and where they need it. And our government for the people understands that. That's why yesterday I was proud to stand with the Premier, with the Minister of Infrastructure and the great member from Niagara West to announce that our government is investing $500,000 to a planning grant that will go towards the redevelopment of the West Lincoln Memorial Hospital and $8.5 million in money for much-needed infrastructure repairs. The fact is that hallway health care is a multifaceted problem that is going to require innovative and new solutions. And this announcement ye yesterday is part of that plan. Response. Our government is determined to ensure that everyone in Niagara West and everyone in Ontario has access to excellent quality health care in excellent quality situations. Thank you. Next question, the member for Niagara Centre. Thank you, Speaker. Through uh, you to the Premier, auto manufacturing has been the cornerstone of the Niagara region's economy for over half a century. The news that the GM plant in Oshawa will be closed by the end of next year is causing anxiety for all those that rely on the auto sector for their livelihood. I, the member from Niagara Falls and the member from St. Catharines, stand shoulder to shoulder with our brothers and sisters in Oshawa. The events of this week illustrate that now more than ever, Ontario needs a comprehensive auto strategy. Will this government do the necessary work to develop an auto manufacturing strategy for Ontario to support our most valuable exporting industry, yes or no? Premier. Well, the, the good news through you, Mr. Speaker, the, the good news when I spoke to the President of GM, that they're keeping the St. Catharines uh, yeah, yeah. engine plant that I personally have gone through numerous times in my previous career, and uh, they're great people out there. But we're going to have some good news even uh, and maybe in a month or two months about the Niagara region. We're going to have great news. Just stay tuned. Mark my words, it's going to be fabulous for the Niagara region because now businesses around the world see this government as open for business. Exactly. They realize that they're going into a business-friendly province that they haven't seen for 15 years because, again, the NDP propped up the Liberals 97% of the time on the job-killing carbon tax. Shame and I just wish, Order. I just wish my friend from Niagara would go into St. Catharines and talk to these people with me and tell them I'm for the carbon tax, which is going to hurt your jobs. I'm for Bill 148, that's going to hurt your jobs. Premier will take a seat. Premier will take, stop the clock. Stop the clock. We're allocating a minute for questions, a minute for responses. When the speaker stands up, your microphone goes dead. Just to remind the House, I don't like the hand gestures either. Remember for Brant for Brant. 
Call to order. Start the clock. Supplementary. The member for Windsor. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the Premier. Windsor is standing shoulder to shoulder with our brothers and sisters in Oshawa. In 2010, our GM plant shut down and we lost 1,400 good paying jobs. We will be feeling the economic impacts of the Oshawa closure in Windsor, too. There are over 300 local companies that are part of the Oshawa supply chain mold makers, tool and dye, part makers, and more. On July 18th, I asked this Conservative government if they would commit to creating an auto strategy. They refused, and we've lost thousands of jobs. My constituents are going to fight for auto jobs in Oshawa, Windsor, and across Ontario. They, we, are not going to give up as easily as the Premier did. Will the Premier Question. join the fight for our auto jobs? Will he work with industry and workers, including Jerry Dias, to create an auto strategy? Premier. Through you, Mr. Speaker, we have an automotive strategy. We have a job strategy, and it's the same thing to all manufacturers, no matter if it's automotive or any other manufacturer. I had an opportunity to go to Windsor and go through the facilities. Tremendous amount of automotive part manufacturers, other, other manufacturers. Or and guess what I heard, Mr. Speaker? Our taxes are too high. The hydro's too high. Kill the carbon tax. Get rid of Bill 148. The same steps. <laughs> it's the same policies that the NDP supported their cousins, the Liberals, 97% of the time. Because there's one thing the Liberals and NDP love are high taxes, yeah. hurting the frontline worker, yeah. taking more money out of their pockets. Yeah. We believe in putting Fine. more money into the pockets of the hardworking people here in the province until they'll be able to go out and do stuff. Stop the clock. Start the clock. Next question, the member for Hastings, Lennox, and Addington. Thank you to our team of colleagues for your kind support. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, my question is for my neighbouring Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Our government for the people was elected with a mandate to make life easier for all Ontarians. And after 15 years of neglect, we are doing just that. That's why, along with many of my constituents who are active hunters and fishers from across this province, are so excited to learn about the modernization of Ontario's fish and wildlife licensing service. In particular, the ability to finally print game tags at home. It'll make life easier for people to get outside and to enjoy our great outdoors, especially those folks who live in our rural communities. So today, can the minister update this house on the timeline for the implementation and when our constituents can finally enjoy the new features of this updated service? Here, here. Minister of Natural Resources, Forestry. Well, thank you, Speaker, and I thank uh, my neighbour from Hastings, Lennox, and Addington for the very ex excellent question. He's quite right. This is an exciting time for Ontarians who take advantage of a, our greatest natural resource, our beautiful outdoors. Approximately 2 million hunters and anglers use our automated service to purchase outdoors cards and hunting and fishing license products. This past Monday, my ministry launched our new Fish and Wildlife Licensing Service, or FALLS. In keeping with our promise to make life easier for the people of Ontario, my ministry wants to improve the way that hunters and anglers do business with the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry. Interacting with your government should be seamless, and we've replaced the old service with one that serves everyone in the province. The new system includes features such as a single, single outdoors card and a license summary that can be printed at home or saved on a mobile device. We are continuing to improve the service Response. And in a few short months. People will have the ability to buy all of our hunting and fishing products online, print them at home, spend more time doing what they love in the great outdoors. I will speak more in the supplementary. Thank you. <laughs> supplementary. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I certainly want to thank our minister for your decisive, quick, timely response to the concerns echoed by all of our members here. from across this, this, this legislature. Here, here. And I certainly know that many of our, our constituents are looking forward to finally to this convenience. I've been able to print their tags from the comfort of their own homes. 
and under the leadership of Premier Ford and the Minister, our hunting and fishing communities finally have a government that is on their side, one that recognizes them, their concerns, and works for the people. So, whether it's truly what this is, this is common sense, colleagues. It's common sense changes, like free fishing licenses for our greatest heroes, our veterans, or improving the fish and the wildlife servicing lines. Our government has and continues to demonstrate the customer service mentality that Ontarians expect and they deserve. Question. So, Mr. Speaker, on behalf of our constituents, those who may not have access to the, the technology necessary to print the products online or print them to a mobile device, well, the products minister still continue to be available through traditional means. Thank you. Uh, minister. Thank you again to the member, a great advocate for his constituents as well as for hunters and anglers across Ontario, Mr. Speaker, and that's a great supplementary question. I think that's important to note that just because we are adding new features to the updated service, it does not mean that we are taking away other features. We recognize that not everyone will be able to fully use some of the mobile and online features of the new system. This service will continue to be available at over 700 license issuers and participating Service Ontario locations across the province. In addition, our Natural Resources Information and Support Centre will continue to sell products over the phone and are happy to assist anyone with questions about our new system. This is a great time to be an outdoors enthusiast in Ontario, and I thank the member for their interest in this new service and look forward to improving the options available for my ministry so that folks can get outside faster and easier than ever before and enjoy the great outdoors. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Next question, the member for Toronto, St. Paul's. Good morning, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Education. Yesterday, in light of recent events at St. Michael's College Hospital, <coughs> sorry, I held a town hall in my riding of Toronto St. Paul's called Breaking the Silence, where parents, youth, and community members gathered to have courageous conversations on how to keep our kids safe. One parent expressed concern that their child would be a target of bullying because they don't fit in with the school's sports culture. I heard from other parents that incidents like this call for systemic change, where a culture of silence and, st and stigma needs to be shifted. Speaker, can the minister tell us how the government is combating bullying in our schools when the minister is sitting back as our kids are being taught by outdated, dangerous health and physical education <laughs> curriculum? Thank you. Minister of Education. Thank you very much. And Speaker, first and foremost, I completely reject that premise that the member opposite actually put forward. Because the, the fact the fact of the member matter is the member, I appreciate the empathy that she is ab absolutely spot on. We need to be standing by member every for student Essex. in Ontario. And the fact member of the matter is families matter, and that's why we have the consultation going on for the parents. The member opposite or whoever was heckling said, what about the parents? We agree. What about the parents? We heard from them loud and clear during the campaign this past spring, and that's why we introduced this comprehensive consultation for the parents.ca, because we want to be hearing Concept. And when I'm out and about talking about what we need to do to improve our curriculum, Response. as well as our learning environments in our classroom, students, teachers, parents are providing such great, rich information. We're going to be on the right track after this conversation. Supplementary. Thank you, Minister of Education, for the non-answer. My question is back Order. to the minister. The conversations I had with parents covered bullying, gender-based violence, and social media safety. And by the way, they were not convinced that the parent consultation had anything to do with actual parents or kids. They expressed a desire to have more information and tools to combat these issues at school and at home to address the various ways in which bullying and harassment manifest itself in child's lives every day. One parent said that their kids need more information on who to turn to when they witness or experience bullying or violence. Every single person in the room Question. asked for more information on consent. What is this government doing to ensure 
that our kids feel empowered to speak up for themselves or others when witnessing or experiencing violence or bullying again when this minister thank you no. minister thank you very much members please take your seat Okay, we are doing so much. We are doing so much more than the past administration. I am proud of what we're doing over here. And Speaker, I would suggest to you that tone that was thrown over to me is nothing but bullying. I will not be bullied into our particular Order. action because I believe what we're doing is spot on because it's completely warned. based on what the parents wanted. I, I ask her to submit her report to fortheparents.ca. Thank here, here. you very much. That was the shortest standing ovation so far. Member for Kitchener, Conestoga. My question is also for my neighbouring minister, the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Farmers in my riding have been facing challenges with the high levels of Dawn or vomitoxin in their corn. Yesterday, I was happy to inform them that the minister announced our government, in partnership with the federal government, is providing assistance to farmers experiencing revenue loss because of high levels of vomitoxin through the Canadian Agricultural Partnership. Farmers in my riding were happy to hear that our government is providing help for our farmers in addition to any assistance farmers may receive from insurance coverage and Agricorp. This support will help ease the impact for affected farmers and assist the entire grain sector in better managing challenges caused by this plant disease in the future. Can the minister please tell us what type of assistance farmers with high levels of vomitoxin in their corn can expect from our government? Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank the member from Kitchener Conestoga for his dedicated leadership on this issue. I was pleased to announce yesterday that our government, together with the federal government, will be providing assistance to farmers with high levels of dawn on their corn through the Canadian Agricultural Partnership. We're going to be opening an application process aimed at covering a portion of the eligible farmers' expenses from on-farm testing for vomitoxin levels. We're also supporting new projects to help address challenges at different points in the value chain, such as finding ways to best process or market the impacted corn. We are partnering with the Grain Farmers of Ontario on research and new action to reduce the frequency and impact on, of high levels, including finding temporary options to store corn and improve grain quality. Our government Response. is committed to continuing working across the value chain, the Grain Farmers of Ontario, the federal government, on any next steps. Thank you. That concludes question period for today. Member for Orléans, in support me, she has a point of order. Merci. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I made a promise on Monday to provide some literature to our Premier and our Minister of Francophone Affairs. I did. I just want to make sure that uh, it's on record that I'm handing this to the Premier and just to make sure that he understands it's not 3 percent, but 4.7 percent. It's not a point of order. This House is recessed until 1 p.m.